Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I'm very happy today to have as my guest, Dr. Miriam Maisel, uh, who's a uh, physician uh, certified in lifestyle medicine and family medicine, a, a, an extensive background in, in really helping people get well, utilizing plant foods and using plant-based medicine. So welcome, Dr. Miriam. How are you? Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association, the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle, as well as water-only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross-section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frank. I'm quite well today. How are you? I'm good. Our, our paths have kind of crossed in the airwaves in many ways that we never really had a chance to, to actually meet. So I'm, I'm very yes. excited. I'm very excited about this. This is great. Yeah, me too. Miriam, in your journey, I, I'd, I'd love to know, um, what were, was there any, uh, you know, period where there was aha moments that really was the turning point for you in your mindset of moving into the plant-based way of, of looking at things? Uh, give mm. us a little background on your journey. Yeah, so um, from quite a young age, I um, was inspired to become a vegetarian. And this was um, nothing to do with medical. I wasn't anywhere near even considering medicine at that time. But when I was about 14, I just really felt that it was not necessary for, um, for us. Uh, that many cultures live without eating lots of meat. I'd read Diet for a Small Planet by Francis Moore Lapay, which was fairly new at that time. And um, I was dabbling in yoga as well. And that kind of, so I became um, a vegetarian um, and kind of stayed as a lacto ovo vegetarian um, for many years. And, and, um, when I was in um, medical school, I actually almost had to hide being a vegetarian because it was considered a little bit weird, a little bit fringy. What, what changed things for me uh, was, was really the internet. And I started to look into fasting. I was interested in medical fasting and I found uh, Dr. Furman's book, um, uh, Fasting and Eating. Um, and, um, and through that, um, I realized that there was actually a lot of information out there that I hadn't heard of, I didn't know about. And so I, I had a visit to True North Health in California, Santa Rosa, and I had lots of time to learn and read while I was there. And, um, you know, I had been drifting away from dairy anyway, because I found that it didn't really agree with me. Um, but when I left uh, True North after my first visit, the, the dairy stopped, uh, no more eggs, no more oil. And um, I started to read very wide, widely. So uh, Colin Campbell's uh, classical book, which uh, the, the uh, China study, um, I, I read all of uh, McDougall's uh, information that was available at the time and um, uh, Dean Ornish's approach to things. And, and, uh, and then I became aware of the existence of the lifestyle medicine movement. And, um, you know, I remember, I remember in hindsight that I had seen a, a book by, by Dean Ornish I looked at it and, and the recipes were so terrible. I thought, well, who, you know, who would ever do this unless they were really at death's door? And I kind of didn't think about it much more. I um, met um, uh, Dr. Esselstein as well. I met Dr. Furman. 
And so, you know, there was a period of a few years where I really took time to, to intensely uh, try to educate myself about. And yeah. then I certified in lifestyle medicine. I was with the first uh, group of physicians that did the certification in Scotland, the International Board of uh, Lifestyle Medicine. Miriam, I noticed that you went to a college medical school in New England and you did your residency even at Brown. You had a very special family medicine residency at Brown. Are you from New England? Is that where you're from? Uh, I'm from New York, Long Island okay. originally. So as good as. That's good. <laughs> yes, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of that education, a lot of that turn on happened after you were already a licensed physician when you really got oh, into- Oh, absolutely. I was licensed and, these, uh, and board certified. Right, and right, right. Had And was about, um, I don't know, about 15 years post uh, board certification. At so how did, a nice, uh, how did a nice girl from Long Island end up in Tel Aviv? Let's get into that story. That's kind of an interesting story. Yeah, this also happened when I was very young. Um, as a teenager, I was interested in visiting Israel and uh, managed to do that. And when I um, spent a summer here, I felt very inspired to come back. I was interested in the boots. Um, and uh, so when I finished high school, I came back. So I didn't go to college uh, right away. Um, and I came back and I lived in a sort of community that was uh, one of the first places in Israel that used organic farming. Uh, they were considered completely fringe and off the wall, you know. Was it a, was it a kibbutz? Was it a kibbutz? It was a moshav. It was yeah, okay. a moshav, but it was very communal, you know. I see. Um, yeah. And so that was a, that was a big uh, turn on for you then. And that made you want to come back at a later time to live there. Is that why? Well, I, you know, I, I was there in my late teens and early twenties, and then I was interested in health and I happened to, um, uh, start to get, uh, interested in meditation and I was practicing Tai Chi with, um, actually a Japanese, uh, teacher who, was in Israel for personal reasons, but had studied and practiced Tai Chi and could teach. And then this is the late seventies, Frank. So there wasn't a whole lot of this around no, anywhere. Yeah. And so I felt at that time that I wanted to develop that line more, um, and to learn maybe one of the Japanese methods of uh, treating like Shiatsu. Well, you know, it's funny so, back in the seventies, I actually had a chance to study personally with Wataru Ohashi, who was one of the oh. real shiatsu innovators way yeah. back. So I'm, I'm resonating with what you're saying because I, yeah. remember, I remember those times, you know, yeah. back in those days. So I was, I actually went to Japan and I was in Japan oh. for about three years. I learned a lot, but I didn't exactly learn what I had set out to learn because there were, uh, you know, there, there would be like rival schools, um, there would be, you know, the school that was belonged to the father and then the students wanted to break away. So they would change something just so that they could be a different school. Right. And I, I think that was when I didn't have the vocabulary for it at that time, but that was when I felt like there needs to be an evidence base, you know, right, right, right. um, and actually that is what propelled me back to study um, conventional medicine. I see. Do you yeah. still, are you still a practitioner of Tai Chi, Qigong or any of that? So I do a little bit of Tai Chi occasionally, but I discovered also for myself that what was most important for me in that, in that practice was actually meditation. Right. And not so much the, you know, the therapeutic aspect. And so, um, so I have continued to, to meditate and, you know, I've learned in uh, mostly in, in Buddhist traditional contexts. Right. I'm, I'm here with Dr. Uh, Miriam uh, Maisel, and we're uh, getting involved in a, a very intriguing discussion. We're going to take a few moments just to uh, hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association, and we'll be right back. And now to put a smile on the sponsors of the National Health Association, you're listening to the Health Science Podcast Show. I want to remind you to visit the National Health Association website. 
where you'll find incredible resources to support your healthy lifestyle, including plant-exclusive eating without added salt, oil, and sugar. Simply go to healthscience.org or nationalhealthassociation.org. Be sure to check out membership, which is $35 per year for those living within the U.S. and $55 for those living outside the U.S. You'll be amazed at all the information and benefits you'll receive. As a member, you're kept up to date on the latest evidence-based tools for health promotion. You'll receive the incomparable quarterly magazine, Health Science, a beautiful 40-page advertising-free publication mailed to your home or offices loaded with articles, recipes, inspirational stories, and interviews with world leaders in the fields of personal health, plant-based nutrition, water-only fasting, animal rights, and environmental support. And you'll receive details about life-changing events, such as the 2023 NHA Conference set for June 23 to the 25th, 2023, in Cleveland, Ohio which will be the NHA 75th Annual NHA Conference. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and now back to the show. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I'm here having a great discussion with Dr. Miriam and myself. And uh, I wanted to go into the issue of lifestyle medicine. I'm very curious because you've traveled so much internationally. Um, what is the climate like in Israel for lifestyle medicine, for these kind of alternative ways of treating. I mean, Israel has such an incredible tradition. When I was in science, you know, I was inundated with the Weizmann Institute and some of these incredible institutes that do remarkable evidence-based work. So what's the climate yeah. like for someone who's trying to do this approach, this lifestyle medicine approach? I'm very curious. Yeah, I think that, you know, the smart and ambitious people and the people who go for fellowships and you know, abroad and so on, they are really focused on uh, tertiary care. Uh, but family practice as such is very strong in Israel. Um, and there is focus on prevention, like stopping smoking and people should do physical activity. Uh, diet is not there yet, you know, although uh, Israel has got, I think, the highest per capita number of vegans um, and even lots of little vegan. There's a lot of vegan junk food in Israel. <laughs> uh, there's also wonderful fruits and vegetables and things like that. Um, but um, there is now um, an Israeli branch of uh, PAN, Physicians Association for Nutrition. Although it's physicians, it says, but it was actually, it's, it's run by someone who's a, a nutrition dietitian a nutritionist dietitian with uh, an MA and who's, I think, very, very good. And, and they do outreach to doctors um, and have uh, webinars and so on. Uh, the lifestyle medicine in Israel, you know, Israel is very small. So everything seems to have a strong personality. And, and so uh, the person who is the kind of in charge of it, um, is not interested in plant-based nutrition. Uh, so that's a little bit difficult for me, you know? Yeah, of course. And, and um, at the same time, you know, I mean, I mean, this person actually said, I don't want to talk about plant-based nutrition. <laughs> and, and, you know, we go with the Mediterranean. Of course, Mediterranean could be, you know, what you want it to be, basically. Uh -huh. But it, it could be plant-based, depending how you do it. Um, and so I did propose that uh, one could have some kind of meeting about nutrition and plant-based as one of the patterns that is uh, uh, valid. Well, and uh, when you, when you may, I'm assuming you make those kinds of recommendations routinely with the clients. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. So how, is, how is the compliance of that? How do you, how do you ascertain that with your people? Yeah. So, you know, I have a private clinic now, which is, um, so I'm not seeing uh, everyone and anybody. I'm seeing the people who found me and want my advice. Right. Okay. So, so, got, so they got, know it's going got to be planned. You got, a captive, you got a captive audience and you're speaking a little bit to the choir, right? I got it. Better. You but, know. You ha but you haven't, you haven't butted up against 
uh, any major contentiousness of the medical profession itself in Israel for what you do? No, or? no. I think you know. I'm. I'm. You know, I didn't study here. Most of my career, I practiced in the UK. Right. So I'm not really known. You know, there hasn't really been any kind of uh, clash of that nature. Right. Um, With your history in the UK, how was you? How was your experience working in the NHS? How was that for you? So I started working there in the 90s, and one of the really strong reasons that I went to work there was an interest in palliative medicine. Um, and they were really the first and the best to provide good hospice medicine historically. Um, and then, um, so I learned a lot. Um, Oh, so at that, when at that point you were interested in end of life care, that kind of thing, is that uh, what... as part of good general practice, as part of okay. good family practice. But I did work in um, uh, several different hospice departments and in standalone hospices as a training. You know, I, I didn't want to only do that. Uh, but by the way, you know, you see a lot of what I always call diseases of self-destruction in the people who, um, you know, smoked too much, drank too much, um, yeah. all these, you know, things that put you at risk for malignancies. Um, then um, I managed to transfer my American family practice qualification into general practice over there, uh, mostly because I had a lot of interest. I was trying to study different things. I, I, I took on work that was very flexible, um, kind of shift work in uh, what we called the out of hours. You know, so when the general practices are closed in the evenings and the weekends, then we would see those patients. And of course, it is uh, free at the point of service. You know, you're not trying to sell anything. Up until maybe a little bit before Corona, I, I think it was the best general practice in the world. Things have kind of uh, gone downhill considerably. And I think it's partly that successive um, uh, conservative governments have decided that they like free enterprise and the American system would be so much better. But, um, I, you know, I'm not convinced that there even is an American system. <laughs> and um, I, I think people who have, uh, you know, never had to pay specific health insurance, um, never had to pay for medicines and operations and, and all these things, I, I think it would, the loss of the NHS would be a, a disaster. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, one of the yeah. one of the downsides of how people address that is that the idea that you know there could be long waits for kinds of care that you know you may think are maybe more emergency in the moment. But you know, I talk to so many people in the U.S. They're dealing with such catastrophic problems and they can't get a doctor's appointment for four or five months. So yeah. you know, all the drawbacks they try to point at those national healthcare systems. Uh, frankly, we're not doing much better and you're paying through the nose for, you know, ridiculous kinds of care at times. So, yeah, so I, it, that's pretty, I, I'm here with uh, Dr. Miriam uh, Maisel. Uh, Miriam, let people know where they can find you. What What's the best place uh, online to find you, to follow you, to learn about you? Yeah, so um, plantbasedlifestylemedicine.com. Perfect. Um, uh, I can be uh, contacted through the website. I be can be contacted. My professional email is on the website, so I can be contacted that way. And I am um, working on uh, creating a little YouTube channel Good. Um, that should be up. I, I, I think there should be something up there in the next, in the next month or so. Uh, also, if you Google my name, once you get past the uh, television personality with the same name, you you will find me <laughs> just by Googling with my with Dr. Miriam Maisel. Yeah, you got to get past yeah. Mrs. Maisel, I guess. Yes, the very yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I also noticed when I looked, uh, it was looking, you know, for information about you that you have a uh, a really nice ongoing coaching program. So during Corona. Um, I did a lot of 
studying and trainings. And one of the things that I did was a coaching qualification, um, which was very interesting. I had a few doctor clients. I wanted to offer, you know, more to doctors because I feel like nobody understands uh, doctors except for another doctor. And that the, the market is quite saturated for, for general coaching. Um, it didn't really, really take off. Um, and uh, meanwhile, also during Corona, I did a qualification in stress management. So this was through the um, Benson Henry Institute, which is based at Harvard. It's an eight week stress management program that um, uh, is based on, on, on Dr. Benson's uh, work. It's called SMART stress management and resiliency training. Yeah, and I, and wanted, so, I wanted to talk to you about that because that, yeah. that, that work has always been so remarkably important in my own work. And a lot of the docs that are in the hygiene movement, the that association, and even the lifestyle medicine don't necessarily address stress and resiliency as much as they, sh- or they should. And Benson, yep. was, and Benson was one of the granddaddies of the mind-body movement Yes. And I, know, I know he passed away within the last year or so. So let me ask mm-hmm. you this. Give me, I know you got that certification. Give me a little bit about your journey into that mindset. Why you yeah. feel that's so important to you and for the work that you do. As I mentioned earlier, I've been involved with meditation and mind body things actually since I was a teenager. And, um, and I've practiced meditation and continue to do so in traditional Buddhist contexts. I was looking for something that had a mind-body um, emphasis that could be brought to people in a secular way. But I found that I, I just didn't enjoy it that much. And then during Corona, I found this program. Um, so um, it's a very interesting program because it's not only... Uh, people think, oh, you know, you just need to relax and chill out and, and, and whatever. But the program helps people, first of all, learn to recognize the signs of stress in themselves and to learn to recognize that experientially um, uh, through various um, uh, practices that we do together in the class. Um, and I've had, I think the last two years, I've, I've taught, um, I don't know, half a dozen groups of doctors in the U- who are in the UK. They get continuing education uh, credits for taking my course. Um, but it's, you know, we as doctors, even every allopathic doctor, every surgeon, we know that um, a lot of the symptoms that people come to us with are stress-based. And we know that stress also makes symptoms worse. Um, but we don't know, nobody taught us, you know, how to how to relate to that. So if you go to the doctor and the doctor just says, now look, you know, you're just stressed. So kind of get out of my office and don't waste my time. Right? <laughs> right? Um, and um, for lack of anything more helpful to say. But uh, you know, doctors are people too, and doctors experience huge amounts of stress, um, huge amounts of responsibility, time stress, um, uh, uh, frustration when things don't go well, and so on. So, so my feeling about teaching this to doctors is that if we are able to to understand our own stress experientially and physiologically. And, and and get some tools and skills to work with that, then we can understand our patients much better as well. And um, uh, either help them directly with some advice or refer them to practitioners or different um, activities that can be helpful for them. Do you actually teach the meditation techniques like Benson did, this short mantra type relaxation response? Is that something you um, share or is that not what you really share? I share mostly um, focus on breathing, on sound, and on the experience of the body. And, you're teaching- and I mention other things, you okay. know. Um, 
Do you bring this into your lay practice at all? I notice you do it for professionals. How much of it is involved in your lay practice? So um, I'm looking for the way to do that now here in Tel Aviv, um, ah. but I haven't yet. I haven't yet set it up. Okay. Um, uh, if if to do it with individuals, one can always one can do you know not the whole course. One one can just bring what's relevant to that individual. But I think it's better to learn it to get a basis in the group. Yeah, I agree. Uh, because people also share their experiences, and then you find okay, you know, my stress expresses itself as a headache. Somebody else, it's a palpitation. Somebody else, it's a tummy ache. Somebody else, it's a dry mouth. You know, but you 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 hear it, you experience it, and for a person to be able to recognize their own stress and say in a given moment, oh. Oh wow! I am stressed. Then it's not blaming, you know, the traffic, the noise, the person who gave me a dirty look. You know, it's like, oh yeah, I'm stressed. Now, what am I going to do about it? You know, right, right. Um, and also, this, um, you know, in these highly stressful professions like medicine, police, um, you know. Um, carers of all kinds, there's stress that carries over from day to day to day. And so um, that's a recipe for creating chronic problems. Right. And, and it's also a recipe for developing habits that are kind of, you know, it looks like it's making you feel better in the moment, have a drink, have a cigarette, have some you know, junk food. But uh, if you do that every day, it's also going to take a toll. And, well, it's like, uh, it's like we focus on cause and that winds up just masking cause. And we know what the, you know, we know the downside in the law yeah. of masking cause. And that's a problem. So you got to get, absolutely. You gotta get absolutely. To, at the heart of the matter a little bit. And that's what you're doing, which is fantastic. I, I'm, I'm trying, you know, yeah. so, so um, the doctors who've been doing this with me and there's been some physiotherapists nurses they are so happy <laughs> and i feel like one if you help one doctor or one health professional that influence can go a long way because they can they can pass that on they can pass that influence on to their well uh, you know you're, you're you're caring for the caregivers which is really yeah. a very and i'm sure when when you receive that you're just grateful that someone is even taking the time to do that which is yeah Oh, it's a remarkable and, mitzvah, really. It's a beautiful thing to do. Yeah, so. it is a mitzvah. And, you know, I it has been up until now only on Zoom. Um, and, you know, I've thought, oh, maybe it should be done live or in the workplace or whatever. Um, and so I think maybe, you know, the Zoom model is actually has some advantages in that yeah, way. There's, a, there's an advantage of accessibility for people that maybe yes. can't can't leave their environments and so on and so forth. So it's Absolutely. beautiful. It's beautiful. Absolutely. Now you, you actually went and did some um, additional, you know, training, as you mentioned at True North. So you did a little bit of certification in fasting. Do you do any of that in your practice? Do you fast? I, people? I refer people. You refer you know, people. I refer people because, um, um, you know, you really, I, I don't want to be the person who's taking care of someone 24 hours a day seven days a week for the duration of a, a fast. Right. Um, and, um, I, you know, I refer, I advise, I, I have people who have come to me who have been advised to fast by uh, unqualified people who take it upon themselves to advise. And I mean, I had someone who did a five day water fast and he was on half a dozen cardiac medicines and oh, yeah. he, he nearly, you know, he nearly died. You know, I and see so, these fasting, I see these fasting groups online and yeah. you know, someone is saying, well, I'm in the 30 day of my fast and I'm having this kind of pain. Anybody got an idea? And I'm like, oh no, please don't yeah, do that. Yeah, exactly. It's horrendous. Exactly. It's horrendous out there. I know. Yeah. It's ridiculous. So how does Dr. Miriam take care of herself? How does the, how does this physician heal thyself? How, what's your day to day like? My day to day includes um, a good period of meditation in the morning. 
um, uh, eating well, plant-based, um, physical activity in Tel Aviv. I, I walk everywhere. Uh, and I never use my car except for at the weekends. I can walk to work, I can walk to the shops, I can walk to the beach. Um, uh, and uh, I really only need my car for when I get out of Tel Aviv and do some hiking, which I try to do uh, once a week. I try to get out in nature somewhere. And, as, as, you know, keep in contact with people who have uh, shared interests. Yeah, so you have a little well. bit of social networking and things like that. that yeah, you, absolutely. It's so absolutely. important for our mindset and for our health. I know, very important. Well, as we wrap this up, do you have any final words you'd like to share with the audience out here? I think that taking care of oneself does not need to be very, very complicated. One does not need to run marathons and swim the English Channel and, you know, necessarily be an Ironman of some kind. Um, I think um, having a sense of purpose and caring about being uh, being alive and well, you know, I think that that provides the motivation to take care of one's health. That's what I would say, you know, but there's always, you know, there's learning, learning, you know, some people don't know how to boil water. You have to kind of uh, explain things to them a little bit. Um, right. When right. I see patients in the clinic, I, I give them an hour and a half uh, consultation. And then if they have small questions, um, you know, like, oh, did she say, I don't know, you know, red grapes or green grapes, they can email me and I'll always answer them. And, you know, if they've had a health challenge or if they, you know, if they need uh, further input, then we can make uh, shorter appointments. I try to make it possible for people to come to me, uh, even uh, if uh, even if they don't have much money. So, um, you know, we work something out. Some of the patients are covered by private insurance. A lot of them can make back the cost of the visit by getting rid of some of the supplements that they. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that they, you know, so, um, but, you know, I'm semi-retired. I'm not under pressure myself. So I also, I can be very relaxed about what I'm doing and I'm very privileged in a way that I can do things now the way I want, the way I see fit and not compromise. Right. Well, I just want to express my heartfelt thanks for you taking the time today to share your knowledge, your heart, you know, your experience. And I urge our viewers and listeners to uh, follow Dr. Maisel and uh, her, her location will be in the show notes and you'll see that. And I also want to thank all the viewers and listeners out there because without you, we couldn't do what we do. And I want to thank you for being part of this really active, healthy community. Um, I'm Dr. Frank Sabatino, the host of the Health Science Podcast, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Health Science Podcast. Thank you. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant-exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review, and we'll see you on the next show.